Now, on the evening of November 9th, 1989, Berliners from the east poured through the wall that had divided them from West Germans for 28 years. Within a year, the two Germanys had unified and the Cold War in Europe had ended peacefully. 30 years later, what kind of lessons can a divided nation like Korea learn from the German experience of 1989 and 1990? Well, we have a special guest in the studio this morning, Dr. Bernhard Zelliger, resident representative of the Hans Seidel Foundation in Seoul. Now, headquartered in Munich, the Hans Seidel Foundation is one of six nonprofit political organizations in the Federal Republic of Germany. Dr. Zelliger, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me here. Now, you yourself have lived both in a divided Germany and a unified journey. Germany. You lived through the fall of the Berlin Wall on, on November 9th, 1989. Tell us, uh, where were you doing what at that time, and what did it mean for you? Actually, I just uh, finished school and I had to enter the army. We had a conscription army that time, and so I experienced it as a soldier. But it was for me really a great event in my life because my family had been divided before uh, unification and oh. as a child I grew up fortunately I would say in the west but we uh, visited our relatives in the east in Karl Marx city now Chemnitz again and uh, certainly for us the fall of the wall was as well unexpected as really a blessing. Now, 30 years later, how do the German public view or feel about the incident? I mean, looking back, was reunification a good thing for people of both East and West Germany? Or is there still a gap that needs to be narrowed? Well, speaking from a uh, scientific point of view, all indicators show very clearly how much the life in the East improved. And that is social indicators like life expectancy or how much uh, space people have, how much they earn, uh, how much uh, education they receive, how many doctors there are. All these indicators are very, very positive. And most of the people see that also. But what we maybe underestimated was really the big gap in the societies and also the problems of the societies to grow together. And so there are still a lot of people who feel this gap. And we saw it in recent elections that this sometimes also can translate into populism on the right and on the left and some instability which we are uh, not very happy about in the moment. So there's still some work to be done to grow together as a social community or as people together, yeah? Right, even 30 years later. Um, but looking at it from a Korean perspective, of course, like you said, you were a divided family um, yourself with, uh, between East and West Germany. Um, but you were able to visit your family members in the East, which is a different case here in the Korean Peninsula. As a resident representative of the Hans Seidel Foundation, you work on various projects related to North Korea. You make frequent visits to North Korea, as I'm aware. Uh, can you compare and contrast the North Korea that, you, that you've experienced in recently and how it was in East Germany leading up to the reunification? <laughs> there, there are some similarities, actually, though they are more maybe an emotional feel, like if in the morning if you smell the cheap coal, that is something like a childhood memory from East Germany, or you have these shops in, in Pyongyang, in the hotels we stay, where you can only buy with dollars. And you had similar shops, the so-called intershop in East Germany, where you could only buy with Deutschmark, with West German mark. So there are these similarities, but the main thing is very, very different. I mean, time went on. It's now 30 years gone. And I think there was one big difference that in uh, North Korea, we see now such a huge gap of Pyongyang and a few other cities and the countryside, with Pyongyang being relatively modern and adopting modern technologies as much as they can and a uh, building boom, and at the same time, a very, very harsh and difficult life in the countryside with technologies like, like plowing with oxen, which they use in thousands of years, and there seemed to be no progress. That might be really a breaking point, and this uh, did not exist like this in East Germany. Well, um, <clears throat> so Germany peacefully ended its decades-long division in late 1989 and early 1990. But I've, I've been told by many experts, including yourself, uh, through our conversations, that you know we need to avoid making direct historical analogies between the two cases because 
on the East and West Germany's case, there was never a bloody conflict, mm -hmm. whereas in the Korean Peninsula in the early 1950s, we experienced that conflict, military conflict, if you will, between, between the mm -hmm. two. Now, what can the two Koreas learn from the German example? It's very, very difficult to learn from a, such a distant example. But one thing which we learned after unification, first we thought it's political difference. It's so difficult to grow together. And then uh, we overcame that in only one year. And then we thought the economy is so difficult. We have unemployment problems, etc. But we overcame that also. And what remains is really that the mindset of people was very, very different. In only 40 years of division, and though we had frequent visits, and even uh, not a few East Germans could visit the West once they were over a certain age, and. Uh, I think that is a point you could also look at that this 70 years of division brought very, very different societies. And then as a consequence of that, try to make as many opportunities as possible to have people meet each other. And you know, that's not only a problem of North Korea, which makes it very, very difficult to visit, but also of South Korea, because visiting North Korea is also not allowed from here. And to bring the people together, to have civilian exchanges, I know it's a taboo here and because of the things you said, but uh, to allow people to meet as often as possible in third countries or in North Korea would be, I think, a very, very good point. And we saw that I, as a, uh, um, a pupil in school, we had to go to East Germany, to East Berlin at least once. And I think it was a good program. And exchanges of young people uh, or bringing North Koreans out to study elsewhere, with, maybe with the help of your government, there would be many things which are very, very important to overcome this barriers between the minds of the people. Well, so people-to-people -people exchange is very important, you're saying, in this. Now, um, last but not least, when you reflect back 30 years ago of you know, what you felt, what you saw leading up to the fall of the Berlin Wall, mm. how close would you say the two Koreas are to reunification? Uh, if I knew that, I probably would invest <laughs> in the stock exchange, but <laughs> no, uh, I think it's very, very far. It's really the, the gap actually grew in the past. And I think it's not so much a problem of what is sometimes called here unification education. I think unification will come when there's a free decision possible for both sides. But it's really, um, you have to see that you need to create the precondition. And that's not so much talking about unification, but it's more talking about how to live peacefully together. So peace and rapprochement must come first and that can help then to create the condition for unification. All right, uh, Bernard Zelliger, resident representative of the Hans Seidel Foundation. Uh, many thanks for your sharing your stories and your insights this morning. Thank you.